Today, we are, are taught dealing with a, a really interesting topic. Um, if you are concerned with personal and social change, we often ask the questions, how best can you do that? And there are all sorts of different ways, but the ones we want to sort of concentrate on today is how storytelling can actually empower people to change themselves and to connect with others to make social change if they think that that's necessary, if that's what they want to do. And um, you can have stories, you can storytell in so all sorts of different ways. We're going to have the war talk about uh, oral history and oral storytelling in a minute, which can be face to face. But in Global Net 21, we've done storytelling through video, through what we call digital stories. And to give you some idea of what that is, I'm going to play you a video now, which shows you a short story, only about a minute and a half, of someone who was a migrant telling about how she came to this country and how and the problems she had in settling here. So let's listen to that. And then after that, we'll go to Devora and we'll talk a lot more in depth about storytelling. But let's hear what this lady is called Shrinker has to say in her particular story. I was a journalist, I was there through the first half of the war working with international war correspondents and they basically took me out because I was collapsing all around them. And uh, I ended up in London randomly, it wasn't a choice, it was um, because I had friends here who said come here. And then I ended up here and the first 22 days it was raining non-stop. And it kind of fitted with my very miserable mood of survivor's guilt and trauma that I carried from Bosnia because it was a very vicious war in Sarajevo. I didn't like London when I first came here, but uh, I probably would not have liked any other place because I just didn't want to be anywhere else. I didn't want to be anywhere. So um, it was my friends and people that I met here that helped me rebuild my life and you know, start working and go to school and gradually start healing. It was the good people of London who helped me heal and that's why I love it now because I had that really powerful experience of belonging somewhere and I think London is so unique that you can, whoever you are, you can find your tribe in a way and you can feel comfortable within your own skin and make choices that you can't make in other places. I hope you all saw that and if you did you can see how using video like that or even audio you can powerfully get people to talk about their experiences and when you do you get to understand those experiences what they've been through in a lot more depth and with a lot more empathy than you could otherwise so storytelling can be powerful Anyhow, Devora is here today and she's going to tell us a lot more about that than I could ever do. And so thank you for doing this with us to Devora. And I'm going to hand over to you now so you can tell us about storytelling for personal and social change. Hello, everyone. I'd like to start by saying that what I'm going to be speaking about this evening, I've gathered from a range of different sources and experiences from different storytelling workshops and courses that I've facilitated, and also where I've been a participant, books that I've read and many conversations that I've had and interviews that I've conducted with other storytellers, writers and psychotherapists who all work very deeply with life stories. And when I speak about storytelling in this webinar, I'm referring to biographical storytelling. So that's telling and sharing stories about our real lives our personal memories and experiences, rather than traditional stories or myths or legends, which are also a very deep source of wisdom and that I work with. But for this session, I want us to focus on sharing life stories with others in a group setting. And for the purposes of Global Net 21, 
I want to speak about the ways that telling personal stories can help us to address wider social issues and potentially also enable greater choice and agency in our lives and cultivate, as Francis has said, empathy and compassion for ourselves and for other people. So why do our personal stories matter? I think that when we tell stories about our lives and the way that we tell those stories, are reflections of the way that we perceive ourselves and define ourselves. So what we feel we deserve, what we believe we're capable of, what's possible for us. And so in this way, our, our stories guide our lives and they can also be very limiting, particularly if we don't have the opportunity to explore them. So how can sharing personal stories help to empower us and our communities. I think that firstly, the shared experience of coming together with others can help to relieve feelings of isolation and loneliness. And then when we hear about what other people have lived through and survived, and also the current dilemmas that they're dealing with, then we can come to understand that we're not alone in having difficult feelings and experiences. And we can recognise that feelings are part of a human life. And love, loss, anger, betrayal, jealousy, fear, all these feelings that we have are universal. And so this insight can shift our perspective from feeling utterly alone. And together with others, I can come to appreciate, for example, that many, many other people also feel fear. And so there's nothing wrong with me because I feel fear. And then in that I can feel a greater solidarity with other people as I learn more and more about them and their lives and what we have in common as human beings. And in this way, listening to other people speak about their lives can move us from feeling alone and ashamed of our feelings or a situation that we find ourselves in to a place of greater self-acceptance. And I feel and I've seen that there's great value in providing places where people can meet and share life stories because so often our conversations are superficial and many of us don't have a lot of opportunity to speak honestly and deeply about what matters to us, what we're really concerned about, what we need, what we wish could be different in our lives and how we feel. So storytelling gatherings where we can tell the truth about what we feel and have experienced can enable us together to see and to face what's really going on in our own personal lives, in our community, in our world, which can help break down the walls of secrecy and cultural taboos. And so as we give ourselves permission to talk about things that are often unspoken or that we have a lot of difficulty speaking about, things like sexuality, death, money, racism, our prejudices, then in doing this, we're no longer silenced, which is so disempowering. So through our storytelling, we can unmask the stereotypes and the filters through which we often categorize each other. And so when we listen to someone, we can really value the person who is telling the story. We can glimpse their reality and what life might feel like from their perspective. We can see someone else's uniqueness and richness and they become real to us. And when this happens, then we feel compassion for people who have a different language, a different culture, a different name for God. And we can understand then why someone might be suffering from a mental illness, why someone might be hungry, why someone might be homeless, because we've learned something about their life circumstances and what's led to them being in a particular situation. When we listen to people tell stories in a group, we can also be extremely inspired, especially when we hear someone who's overcome enormous hardship. And then listening to others can also enable us to reflect on our own lives and give us courage and give us strength and help to mobilise us. 
So dedicating time in this way to listen to others in a group can help us to reorient us as to how, how we want to live, who we are, what we can do, what we want to do. And to, uh, for us to make new choices about how we might want to live differently. And the fact that we're a group of people in the present sharing stories together really celebrates our resilience. Because even if we speak about great horror that we've experienced and the atrocities of trauma, the atrocities and trauma of war and abuse, which I've heard many, many people talk about in storytelling sessions that I've done, I really feel that in the telling of those stories, that in itself is helping us to affirm our own survival and our own courage. And together we are engaged and we're a learning community where every participant is seen and heard and everybody's voice is equally valid and important and worth listening to. So when we tell stories, we tell more than just the facts. We, we don't just say what happened and when. Within the way we tell the stories, we're also expressing our feelings, we're expressing our attitudes. And so in that, we're speaking about how we've made sense of and interpreted our experience. And so when we tell a story, we can also stop and reflect and explore it more deeply and ask ourselves, well, how have I interpreted that experience? And what have I learned from that experience? When I tell that story, how am I perceiving myself? And can I tell that story in a way that I don't only cast myself as a victim, as someone who has no power or no choice or no agency at all? And can I tell that story with compassion for myself, with a sense of self-respect? And there are many different practices that we can do to engender greater empathy and compassion. And I'll just give a couple of examples. We can tell the story in third person, which could give us a little bit of distance from the experience that we're describing. Or we could work with a partner and someone could tell the story back to us. And in that, we might be able to hear it in a different way and see ourselves in a new light. And I just want to say a few words about the role of the listener, because, of course, as well as the storyteller, an essential part of storytelling is the presence of the listener. And the quality of their listening is really vital. And in the groups that I facilitate, it's extremely important that when someone's telling a story, they're not interrupted, they're not interrogated about what they've shared, they're not criticised for whatever they've revealed. And it's also very important that listeners are genuinely interested and attentive. And a warm-up exercise that I often do is I ask people to find a partner and one person is the storyteller and one person's the listener. And then the storyteller speaks about something quite neutral, like what they had for breakfast or how they got to the workshop. And the role of the listener in this moment is to act as if they're completely disinterested and they don't care at all what the storyteller is saying. So we do that for about two minutes, then I ask them to pause. And then I ask the listener now to listen with rapt attention and that they really care about every word the storyteller is saying. So we do that for a couple more minutes and then we stop and then we come together as a whole group and we reflect on what's it been like to be listened to compared to not being listened to, which really highlights the power of active and deep listening. And I've, I found in my work that working intergenerationally and creatively and artistically with life stories is very powerful also. And as an example, I'd like to speak about a couple of workshops that I recently facilitated for East Sussex County Council Adult Social Care, which were to explore the experience of ageing for older black and minority ethnic people who are living in East Sussex. So what we did is we brought together older and younger people and they shared life stories about different topics and themes and different times in their lives. And then later in the day, after the people had had opportunities to work in pairs in small groups within the whole group, then I asked each course participant to create a piece of artwork. So a poem, a piece of prose, a drawing, a letter, whatever they wanted that was inspired by and a response to one of the stories they'd heard that day. 
And then after they created their piece of artwork, then we came together again as a whole group. And each person in turn shared what they'd made and its meaning and significance to them. And the point that I want to make here that really I think links in with the work of Global Net 21 is that during these workshops, participants shared very compelling, personal, intimate stories. And that these stories are also part of a broader discussion about social justice in that the participants spoke about their experiences of racism, women's empowerment, being refugees and asylum seekers. And so this sort of life story work can really encourage dialogue and deeper understanding about important social issues with people of all ages. And the older people were especially keen for there to be many more gatherings in this way, for them to be able to share their life stories and particularly with younger generations. And I just want to finish off by saying that in my experience, I've seen that storytelling has the power to be transformative in the sense that it can decrease isolation and loneliness and enhance a sense of well-being through a genuine and fulfilling kind of social engagement. And providing these kind of forums that I've mentioned, these groups where people can tell and listen to stories can assist us to reflect and to see ourselves and to see other people in new ways. And I think that in turn, this enables us to envision new possibilities for how we might want to live and also what we might want to create for our communities. Okay, thank you, thank you very much. Um, that that was that was a very very crisp uh, uh, introduction to the whole idea of storytelling, and I love the way in which you um, related storytelling in terms of personal experiences to the possibility of of social change, particularly when you were dealing with older people who have memories and and younger people as well who can learn from that um, and learn about a whole series of things like discrimination and racism and so on. Anyhow, this is the time when all of you have a chance to raise questions about uh, uh, about storytelling and ask questions to um, Deborah as well as to make comments. So please feel free to type it in. I'm glad to see we've got quite a few people in, some people who haven't been on for quite a while. Like Dr. Matai, it's really great to see you. Also, I see that Maria's here and Jade's here. That's great as well. And Nick is here as well. Nick is also very interested, I know, in storytelling as a creative way of actually getting people to feel good about themselves and the sort of well-being um, that goes with that. So while we're waiting to people to, to type comments on, and, and please do type your comments in everyone can i ask you um Dora, i mean if you said you know if, if you were to try and identify one purpose of storytelling one thing that you think is really important about it that makes it a cut above other things in a way what would you say it was i think it's the human it's just a very human to human contact and that it's about understanding each other and learning about what it is to be human and finding the places where we have so much in common but also places where our experiences diverge and i think we find that fascinating in each other we love to discover what it is we have in common and how and over what sort of issues and life experiences we can connect and also look at our differences and I think storytelling can also help us look at our differences because it brings in greater empathy and understanding. There's, I, I really feel there's more opportunity to look at our differences with less conflict than if um, we were just trying to prove that we were right. You know, storytelling isn't about trying to be right and be clever. It's about saying, this is my experience. This is what life feels like for me. And everyone has their own version of that. So it's not about judging other people. It's about understanding and wanting to make a connection, I think. 
So, so are you saying that very often in life, when we engage with other people, we do it in the security of a mindset, and that mindset very often can create prejudice, it can create misunderstanding, and it can make people shout at each other, talk to each other, rather than engage and have a dialogue with each other. And is the art of storytelling, if you do it properly, to sort of break down those mindsets so that you can actually understand people across barriers. And then you think differently about people. And that means you think differently about the world in which you live. Yeah, I think you said that really well, Francis. I do. Um, and also, it's about respecting that other people can have different mindsets, you know, that other people have different beliefs but they're not necessarily going to threaten your own, my own, that that's okay, we can live with that kind of a diversity without harming each other. Nick, Nick is saying, um, he says, you know, he's found, and I told you Nick is a person who really believes in creative storytelling and face-to-face -face contact in that way. He says, I have found that when people share stories about when they are happy, it makes them happy it said he says it's just that easy yes yes it's um there's something very infectious in storytelling in that way i think and i think also that's very much people coming together in a group that we affect each other so much okay and and gareth actually um comes in with a sort of health warning for this he says when people themselves reveal their, sto reveal their stories often they can be very disturbing to them and they most often feel the need for support there is a need for su support especially when coming from areas of extreme violence and this needs to be said storytelling can make you happy it can actually engage you better it can make you understand but if you're not careful it could do the opposite couldn't it absolutely that's a really really important point uh, because many people have experienced great trauma and i've worked with different communities who have been you know through absolutely horrific things um, and actually it, it was so important to me to be able to do this ethically and wisely and not re-traumatize people in my work but uh, that's actually what prompted me to go back to university to do a ma in this area to look at how can we tell our stories in empowering and healing ways and avoid re-traumatization and so i looked at the different trauma theorists and what they were saying and looking at how i could bring that into creative practices like this and i mean there are a few things um but, but one thing that is so important is to help people understand that the very fact that they're telling the stories in the present means that they're not actually living through the past that in our languaging, we use the language of the past. And also we do lots of things with our bodies to bring people more present. So lots of kinds of theatrical exercises, a lot lot with a voice um, to, to make that separation between the past and the present. I mean, they're, they're just a couple of examples of the kind of thing, but absolutely, it's really important. And also to just not um, sort of leave people floundering when they leave to have backup support and know that they have people to contact to keep talking about these stories further yeah richard is agreeing with uh, gareth on the health warning and i guess you're saying the same have you ever been in a storytelling situation which has really traumatized people and how do you deal with that when that happens Deborah? um I haven't been in a situation where people are very traumatized. I've been in a situation where many people have spoken about traumatic stories and perhaps the group was shocked. I don't think it was trauma as such, but people were very shocked. Um, a man was uh, speaking about what had happened to him, seeing his family killed um, in Eritrea. And I mean, it was absolutely horrendous. And there were also young people, you know, children in the group and actually, um, it was one of the group sessions where they created a piece of artwork and the when i say children they were sort of in their like nine to eleven twelve year olds and it was very important for them to create a piece of artwork to draw and to write poems they wanted to to this man about his experience and 
I think in that kind of mastery over their artwork, that was helping them work through what they'd heard. And then when they showed what they'd done and sort of they wanted to give their poems and give their pictures back to this man, there was something there that helped them process that experience. So I don't think they left in a traumatised place at all. That the artistic process can really help people work through um, experiences that might be stabilising or difficult to hear. Because in that creation of the art, you're gaining mastery over it. You're creating something, which means that you're not being totally overwhelmed by it. Yeah, Rich, Richard says traumatised people with emotional and development traumas cannot dist distinguish the present from the past. I mean, do you have you found that in storytelling that people don't live in the real world when they're telling their story sometimes? You know, I've, um, I've not actually come across that in a group that I facilitated where someone hasn't been able to distinguish the past from the present. I can I can absolutely see that that could happen, but that's not the situation that I've been in. Dr. Matai is wondering how, when you're in a mixed group of old and younger people, how do you make the stories interesting to all listeners who come from different subcultures? Mm. Um, I, well, I mean, I've just found that the young people have been very interested in what the older people say. That each, I mean regardless of how old or young we are each person is very unique and tells their story in a different way um i think also it's important to say that people have come to the groups voluntarily so they have a natural interest anyway in listening to stories so there's been quite an openness and a receptiv receptivity from the beginning so i guess it would be different if perhaps I imagine, for example, going into a school classroom and some people might not be that interested, some young people, but they would have, you know, have to be, and then it might be harder work to find a way to uh, make them all more interested. But in the groups that I've done, the experience that I've had, and I feel that's all I can really speak to, is that uh, people have been very interested in the older people's stories. And, and the fact that they've come from different cultures has made them even more interesting. I mean, and also, yeah. So and, Sorry, go on. I just also then the opportunity to create a piece of artwork makes it even more personal to them and they find a kind of personal thread or relevance in that as well. So that helps to bring the story you know, even more alive or more meaningful for them. I mean, Ra Raphael takes a, uh, you know, that point up and takes it a bit further and says, when you're in the role of a storyteller teller to an audience of younger people, then how do you try to support the social change that they might be interested in whilst you're making it accessible to everyone there? Yeah, I mean, in a way, um, I think then the social change, I mean, I, there, yeah, there are a couple of things I want to say, but the social change and people sort of coming together and perhaps working on developing a campaign, for example, and then deciding to work towards that regarding a particular issue, I see that almost as stage two, that the life story groups can really bring people together in a very meaningful way to help learn about each other, to discover what it is they're really passionate about, what it is they really uh, feel that they want to devote their energy and time and commitment to. And then in that way, then they can work together, you know, on a particular issue, for example. That's one way. I see, I see that working. But also in terms of what I said um, before, I think just the fact of, of coming together and speaking so honestly and deeply is a change itself because I don't think it happens enough. Um, okay, I mean, Peter Felton raises a question which is interesting about the process of storytelling. He says a friend that he knows has arranged many storytelling circles. Interesting what a storytelling circle is. Maybe you can explain what that is, Devorah. But he says in those circles, um, what he does is he passes a baton around and the one who gets the baton is the next one to speak. Is that a good way of doing it? I mean, how do you sort of process the the, the sort of way, the orchestration of the storytelling experience? Um, 
Yes, well, different uh, with different groups. I work differently. So sometimes it's lots of just pair work. Um, people might not feel in certain situations with certain communities. It might be too much for them to speak in a large group in a storytelling circle in that way. And pair work or just working with groups of three or four uh, might be just right for that group. But storytelling circles, absolutely. Um, and with a baton you pass around and then it's I think if this is what um, he means that then the person with the baton is the only person who can speak and then they have every you know everyone gives them their full attention and yes that's a beautiful way to share it absolutely um Dr Matt I mentioned about how do you deal with older and younger people and Peter says Peter Feltham again says that uh, often there are cultural differences you, you know if you're in some cultures eastern cultures you may have a different empathy between older and younger generation in western cultures you don't have that and it's different in in the subcultures within western culture i mean when you're doing storytelling do you see those differences manifest themselves i see such a respect actually i um i i haven't really i've i've seen because there's something about um and to explain it, um, perhaps the quality of attention, the listening that people give one another, uh, the fact that trying to think what you know what exactly it is, but I've felt um, there's tremendous respect in the room um, for older people, but also for the younger people. The older people are very interested in hearing the life experiences of younger people and how different things are. For younger people now so it works both ways you know um yeah I, I really think the quality of respect is the main thing that comes through regardless of the culture you know in that particular storytelling environment so do, do you do you think if you if storytelling is done effectively empathetically and with compassion it almost overcomes the cultural differences you've got two human beings not two cultures Yes, I mean, and I'm not minimising the importance of culture at all because I, you know, I know that's so much part of our identity, the culture that we come from. But I'm, you know, because I'm just reflecting now on the storytelling groups that I've been a part of and facilitated, and yeah, the humanity is what comes through, um, rather than, of course, there's the cultural difference, but it's almost like that's um a celebration really the fact that there are these differences and just then more questions come in terms of oh well how how is it that you you know what is that festival about for example what do you do what does it mean what's its significance have you been conducting that festival your whole life you know it's then it just it's an invitation for more questions um rather than yeah rather than anything else. It's a kind of respect and an invitation mm. to share more. I mean, Richard says, uh, I mean, raises the question that, that storytelling is, is, is difficult sometimes because families don't even talk to each other. I mean, storytelling sort of, you, you know, you've got to get people who want to do it. And maybe that's just a minority. How do you get, you know, more people interested in storytelling? How can you make it mainstream or is it possible? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question um, because, yes, I'm in contact with people who, as I said before, voluntarily come and want to be there. Um, but, you know, I don't, I don't know how you get more people because I don't believe in force. I only believe in if people have an interest and uh, what, sort of naturally wanting to pursue this interest because that, that openness and that willingness to learn from someone else, that willingness to listen to someone else, those kind of qualities are the most important. So I don't think they're not kind of things you can push or force. Um, but actually, that's really a fantastic question because I'll go away and think about that. And how is it that you can encourage people to be more interested? Um, I, do you, uh, Nick says, I was just looking at questions, I lost it for a moment, but there it is. Nick says, I mean, is there any theory that underpins your practical experience? Um, I can't say there's any one theory. I mean, I have, I guess, 
sort of different ideas uh, which I filtered through in the things that I said earlier. Um, I don't think there's any one particular theory that I could you know, succinctly summarise. I mean, I remember when I was younger as, as a BBC producer doing a programme on, um, on family therapy. Uh, where they got where they got families talking to each other and listen to each other and it was based on the theories of someone called uh, Gregory Bateson construct theory that you had to ch to change people's construct create a new construct of the world I mean do you have any sort of theoretic theoretical background like that um, not especially I have different uh, practitioners different sort of resources and psychotherapists particularly that I've researched and I draw on their kind of work and their ideas a lot of it about uh, empathy and deep listening skills and that sort of thing so but there's no one particular theory but there are different theorists that I've drawn from yeah interesting that Lou says in your in your talk are you really are you underestimating in what you say your own role in creating a safe space for the participants um she says that there is i guess Lou you're she i'm not sure i hope i just apologize if you're not there's a real, real skill in creating this kind of space uh, she says which transcends culture and facilitates mutual respect is the, the the facilitator like you someone who has to be a rather special person oh, i don't know i think i mean i don't know about special person i just think someone who's really interested and really cares about this work and i absolutely love it and really care about it and you know i think because i saw in my own life very early on how powerful storytelling was and i sort of had this inner drive just to keep to keep doing it so that's where it comes from in me um i mean from the time i was quite young my grandmother um she was in a concentration camp and she told me about what that was like she really confided in me and although it was very difficult and i've had to work through that as a child listening to those stories um i could see what it gave her to have a confidant, you know, to have someone that she could share with and trust. And then, you know, then as a teenager, I volunteered for Amnesty International, listening, witnessing stories of women who'd been persecuted. And I feel like I've been doing this for most of my life and it's something that I can do and want to do. And um, it's a way I can be there for other people. Yeah. I, 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 it, but it is a, it is a skill i mean I, I mean just take what i'm doing now with with, yeah. with, with this I, i'm i'm listening to you but i'm also reading questions and i'm multitasking all the time so my concentration is not focused on one thing i have to and, and i miss things sometimes when that happens but i try and put things together so it's a sort of different skill to the sort of skill that goes on in storytelling isn't it where you have to be very focused on the person that's there Oh yeah, absolutely, absolutely, you do. I think that's um, that's a, a huge part of its power. So the sort of multitasking environment that I do could end up in me missing a trick if I was in a storytelling environment. Um, could be. I guess it's good not to have too many other distractions, you could say, and to really be able to focus on who's speaking and what it is they're saying. Maria says, you see they are, I'm reading her question as you answer yours. Um, Maria says, what legal procedures needs to be in place to share these stories for social change? Can these stories, can these stories be shared outside of a group of people that could not attend the group? In other words, it's not just that, that the stories are not just about the people there, they provide a case study of change where other people who weren't there can learn from them. I'm not sure I fully understand the question. Well, take the, take the digital story I did. Shrinker yeah. talked about migration and she was telling her story. Now that could have been the storytelling uh, story, story situation which affected her, but because we videoed it, we then let other people listen to it. In other words, it's not just the, the, the storytelling environment, it's what that story can tell other people who weren't there, who are outside and listen to it. 
do you think that that's valuable as well? And are there legal problems when the stories are confidential? Yes, absolutely. And I would never um, allow stories that were confidential to be told elsewhere. Um, always people sign a recording agreement, you know, a, if they want, if they're willing for their stories to be told elsewhere, um, that's really an important part so that people know that their stories are protected because a lot of people I work with, then we actually um, sort of edit books or we make a documentary film or we use their stories in a play. Um, so for, for any of those stories, people have to sign an agreement and give us permission about how exactly how those stories can be used and it might be that most they, they're happy for most of part, most of their story to be used but they might want to just you know mute out a particular part and then that's never made public i think that's essential that there's that kind of ethical frame and legal framework in that way richard raises rather an intriguing point you know very often it says about psychiatrists that a patient who goes to a psychiatrist very often falls in love with their psychiatrist and richard's asking have you come across people who become codependent with i guess the the, the, the facilitator the storyteller have you had so many people to fall in love with you uh, <laughs> um no <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I'm exaggerating a bit, but you know what I mean. You become you become a, a you become a crutch for them. You become you know something that they hang on to for dear life because you created a relationship with them in the storytelling exercise. Yes, but actually, um, I never foster that, um, and it's not especially in the groups that I facilitate. It's not sort of about me and he's the facilitator. I think in many ways. I think I'm quite invisible because I facilitate a lot of people to tell their stories and they have the attention and the focus and they tell stories with each other in pairs, in small groups. So it's not like they're telling the stories to me, you know, they become very important to each other. So, I mean, it's not uncommon for other people to meet and, you know, fall in love with each other because there's been, you know, a real shared intimacy. But, um, it's not sort of all about me. I know the facilitator has a lot of, um, well, authority really in that position and that's important to, you know, tread carefully in that area. And as much as possible, I give the sort of agency, the authority also back to the storytellers. So, so you don't get loads of Valentine cards as a result of that? No. <laughs> oh, all right, okay. Um, Nick raised something some time back, I left it until now, and that, that he was saying, that, as you said earlier, when a story is told, it's not just storyteller, there's a listener there as well. And whether the storyteller can tell personal things, traumatize things very often, depends upon the quality of the listener. I mean, if the listener is going to shake or cry, the person might, uh, telling the story, feel inhibited in telling the story. How important is the listener skills to be um, developed as well as the storytelling skills? Yeah, extremely, extremely. Because if the listening quality isn't there, people can feel awful or, you know, dismissed. And that's why, I mean, what, I gave one example of um, a listening exercise I did to kind of highlight the importance of what it is to be listened to compared to not being listened to at all. And developing those deep listening skills are really, really important. Yeah, and um, I think, uh, let me have a look, Ra Raphael says, thanks for answering her question, and you know, from storytelling and so on, lots of friendships develop, and often it's through friendships that social change take place. And it's that important because some people will say, oh, this is nonsense storytelling. I'm much more interested in social change. I want to go and um, lobby my MP and go and protest on the street. All this storytelling is nonsense. It's nothing to do with social change. But I mean, Raphael is saying, yes, it, it is because from friendships, then it empowers people. Do you take that view that, that, that storytelling is very relevant to not just cultural change, but social change as well? Yes, absolutely. And as, as you've said about friendship, that is key. And the support that comes with friendship. So that's also what I spoke about earlier, that often without that kind of friendship, we can feel absolutely alone. And then there's not much power in being absolutely alone. And we need each other to really come together 
in terms of creating you know something new and something more sustainable you know and so much of um the resources that are going to help us will come from one another gareth asked ages ago and i left it till later on because it fits in the sequence of things we're doing and he said social change and we're just talking about that now can be influenced by storytelling he mentioned cardboard citizens as a project yes creating social change through issue based drama and he says there are quite a few of these now we're going to look at something right at the end of this webinar from playback theater which does that it actually uses storytelling to create empathy to make us see how we can walk in each other's shoes and that can affect social change you were nodding when i mentioned cardboard citizens i mean is that something you know and is that the sort of thing that is important that gareth was talking about yeah, and um, I know a little bit about them because one of my colleagues in Playback Theatre, which you'll speak about soon, actually works for Cardboard Citizens and she's very passionate about their work. So that's why I was nodding because there was some recognition of their work. And, and, Car and Playback Theatre is another theatre that uses improvised drama to improvise on storytelling to make them yet more powerful, isn't it? Yes, absolutely, yeah. And, and you've seen that playback theatre so you can also comment on what you think its impact is and its potential for social change mm. well I, I went to a, a, a version of playback theatre in, in West London where they were talking to migrants and they combined interviewing migrants where the migrants told their story they would tell their story and as a result of that the theatre group would then do a small piece of improvised drama around that story and it was incredibly powerful on that audience. Um, you know, you saw the audience, many of them almost, in, well, yes, in tears. Um, it really, really affected them and it brought alive and it, it helped change attitudes, which was, which was really, really important.